All right, next in our segment, we'd like to welcome Chris Barnes. Chris is a registered landscape architect and senior associate, associate at SCAPE. Chris works on a range of projects at multiple scales and brings to each project an ability to develop concise solutions to, comple to complex site challenges. Chris is the project manager for the New York Presbyterian and Columbia University Medical Center campus master planning projects and Red Hook Waterfront Development Project. And prior to going to SCAPE, Chris worked as a project designer at a multidisciplinary design firm in Beijing, China, and as a project manager at Thomas Balsley Associates in New York City. His previous work includes the renovation of an urban plaza in Washington, D.C., several high-density residential communities in Asia, and a winning competition entry for an expansive mixed-use waterfront near Shanghai. Chris also earned his uh, Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from Louisiana State University, which we've promised not to hold against him. <laughs> Couldn't help it, Chris. Um, and then again, I promised I would share a little something about the organizations that this slate are joining. And the little nugget I found from SCAPE was that they combine research and practice to reveal the ecological and cultural potential of the built environment, among so many other things that they do, which Chris will talk about. So please help me welcome Chris Barnes. Can you hear me? We're good? Go Tigers, right? <laughs> uh, so at, as the lovely intro introduction, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Barnes. I, I am a landscape architect at SCAPE. Uh, just a little quick uh, of who we are. Uh, we're a firm in Manhattan of about 28 professionals Majority of us are landscape architects. We do have some urban designers and architects, so a little, little bit of a good dialogue going on in the office. Uh, here's the space here. Uh, quickly, just to introduce uh, what we do or how we think at SCAPE. At SCAPE, we uh, don't work simply to restore e ecologies or what once was, because we have kind of moved so far past that that it's kind of unknown at this point, right, with, with climate change and kind of the deep urban world and section that we live in. Uh, so how do we revive these urban uh, these ecological systems within our urban environment and kind of rethink and uh, bring uh, different partners to the table, whether it's ecologists, scientists, or engineers from the beginning and at the onset, and how do we kind of work towards an urban ecology. So this is, uh, Kate Orff just recently published this. It's part manifesto, part manual, part monograph that kind of goes through some of our projects and different approaches. And as designers, we just simply have to be activists, right? This isn't a passive world that we live in anymore, as, as we well know from all the speakers today. Um, this is a great diagram. I think that kind of distills a lot of what uh, we do, and this is kind of a great model for a project, that a project can kind of have these three legs of culture, uh, ecology, and performance. Uh, so culture, who is the audience? Who are the stewards? Uh, how do we educate people or engage with uh, sh stakeholders in the community? Uh, the ecology has to be integrated into the thing. That we're past the point of ornament. Uh, and then what does the, the space, or is it a park? Is it infrastructure? Uh, everything we do, I think, has to have a performance value. Uh, everything is double duty. Um, obviously, just recapping what everything we've heard earlier today, just, you know, this is a great uh, uh, quote from Lawrence Halperin, change has become the essential element of our time. We, we no longer work in a static environment. I'm not sure we ever did, but even more so, it's, it's more poignant. Uh, this is a great diagram. You, can, you know, you are here, right? And everything is in the upward trend, uh, whether it's uh, heat, sea level rise, storm intensity, frequency, and then also the, the densification of our population. So we're at this moment where this notion of the new urban ecology is, is critical in how we, how we address these issues. Uh, this is uh, looking at the USDA hardiness map, just one example. Uh, you know, in the last 20 years, we can see a, a great migration north of, of the hardiness zones, and with that, the invasive range of species, animal species and plants. So this is something real and happening, and, as we're designing, we're designing for useful life. We're not designing for day one. We're designing for day 50, day 100. Um, and this, this also goes back to Christina's point, which is great, is like, what is the notion of natives? You know, is, is that something, as we move towards the future, we really have to rethink in terms of adaptability and, and the species we're using and, and trying to uh, address. Um, and then in New York City, we, we work on the coast, so the coast, coastal work is huge, right? We're relearning baselines. We're learning terms like mean high water and you know, uh, king tide and how these things are moving further and further inland. The 100 year storm, which was really a 1% chance storm, is actually becoly more and more probable. So there's new uh, 100 year storms. So this is constantly changing. 
these periods of inundation or frequency of the storms are constantly changing. So we have to plan for this and just kind of understand, I think, as designers, these baselines and understand this innately, you know, as we move forward and into the world. Uh, where, do, where do we work? So I'm going to talk to you today about projects in New York City. One is at the waterfront edge and the other one is actually intertidal within the water. I was going to do an upland, but we don't, I don't think we have time for that, so there's dots left over. And then looking at the, the urban kind of section, uh, this is kind of where we are on the first project I'm going to talk about actually within uh, the water and then at the edge and really looking how to begin to reclaim or soften the urban edge that's uh, been so urbanized. So the first project is uh, intertidal. This is our living breakwaters project in Staten Island. Uh, so this is a quick snapshot. Uh, this is actually uh, being implemented uh, and we're at 60% design right now, but just a quick history. This is kind of a, a result of a, a design competition in response to Superstorm Standy, where there was a call or a competition for design-led teams, uh, the Rebuild by Design Challenge. Um, and we actually were one of the selected teams, and this was our site, and thinking about how to implement a breakwater that actually is in some ways a living reef structure that not only, it doesn't displace habitat, but actually creates and enhance, enhances habitat within its footprint. So it's actually making better uh, what was there. Uh, one important thing as we go through this is that these do not uh, pre prevent flood, right? They, they just attenuate waves and kind of rebuild the beach and also kind of slow uh, uh, the, the, the kind of erosion of the shore and also kind of mitigate the, the rate uh, of wave intrusion in, inland. So it, there still is like an innate dialogue that people along the coast need to understand that this doesn't erase, right? You're still gonna deal with some of these flood events, but it's gonna be mitigated uh, uh, a little bit. Um, and this is kind of the idyllic vision of the breakwater, right? You have the great harbor seal sitting on top. Uh, that's the ecology. This thing is actually enhancing what was once there. Um, it's performing its function. It's attenuating waves. And then with the human aspect of the culture, uh, it's creating a recreational bay. It's restoring the beaches. We're developing partnerships with institutions upland, with schools, uh, actually coming down to do the monitoring with the harbor schools in the area. So really kind of generating an, an entire kind of I don't know if you call it ecosystem around this object is innately tied to the success of the thing over time. Um, so I wanted to focus a little bit on the ecology today, but uh, not so much the social aspects of the community and who we, the engagement, but uh, so thinking about the critters and the, the uh, fish in the bay and the animals. Uh, so who are, who are we designing for? So step one is going to, we've looked at the history, um, and this is kind of a long, uh, story at, at scape, but you know, the New York Harbor traditionally was rich with oyster beds and oyster reefs. And these are basically ecosystem building species and keystone species, you know, they clean the water. So it's, it's a very critical habitat that we're looking to, in some ways, restore. And here's our site here. So we're right in the, the traditional range. Uh, but over time, due to overfishing and water pollution decline, the reefs kind of declined as well. And with that, the critical habitat that they supported. Um, this is a, a quick, uh, or not quick, an artificial habitat survey that we did uh, of artificial structures nearby. Uh, these were navigation beacons and kind of essentially riprap structures where this habitat was flourishing and that this, this habitat was much more complex and supporting of life than the actual flat sediment bay uh, around it where we once saw the oyster reefs. So this was a great kind of uh, supporting study to, to kind of support the riprap and uh, the breakwater structure that we were trying to develop. And then what are the fisheries of the area? So historically, there was a rich fishing history of the summer and winter flounder, and we know that these were in the area. So the fish were here. They still are here, but you know, the ha habitat is in decline. Um, what is the life cycle of these fish? Uh, you know, from Upper Hudson, the spawning grounds, to the nursery, to uh, where we are here with the bay juveniles, and then out to the ocean adults. So this, this is a cycle, uh, but we are within the bay juvenile. So this is an area where they come to, to mature and grow over time. So how can we support that uh, aspect of the life cycle? Um, and quickly getting into kind of the approach and how we worked with the uh, uh, ecologists and also the engineers to kind of design with these, the shape and face of these things. Um, this is kind of a typical breakwater as you can see, uh, but how do we begin to shape that and make it more complex uh, and habitat conducive? Uh, part of it was how do we uh, avoid critical habitat that is there now um, how do we make it more slender and minimize the footprint? How do we break it apart to allow water to move through it and kind of get more movement around the faces? How do we add co complexity and kind of nooks and crannies to, to the face itself? And then how can we kind of insert uh, bio-enhanced bio armor units to kind of give us a head start 
right? And just kind of make it a little more uh, habitat conducive than say a uh, traditional stone riprap or concrete, uh, Portland cement concrete. Um, and this is kind of where we ended up, where we, we had this idea of this shape that we knew we wanted to, to study further. Um, and also going back to the idea of the juvenile, like actually what is the pore space for these, these juvenile fish, looking at the species and the physical size of the fish. Um, this helped inform the, the size of the stone. Also looking at traditional reef structures and what they uh, provided at one, one time. Um, but, okay, and then, and then we kind of, this all came together as what we coined as the reef street. Uh, which is kind of this, this nook or this, this cr uh, street that uh, has an inherent face complexity, the porosity uh, that allows these fish to seek refuge, but also kind of go out into the street and feed. And uh, also the, the larger fish can come in and, and feed on the juveniles as well. So it really just kind of created this kind of dialogue uh, uh, on the backside of the reef. Uh, working with the ecologists, thinking about the design parameters, you know, this is typically what we do when we work with ecologists. We, we kind of find the critical species or the, the target species, uh, what is their traditional habitat, how can we kind of mimic that and shape that, and what are the conditions? So this is us working, what is the shape, the orientation, the length, the width, so questions we're asking when we're working with the ecologist. Um, and then with the engineers, we kind of put these ideas uh, in the model. Uh, this here on the left is kind of a wave uh, or tidal uh, fluctuation model where we're actually looking at how water moves around the breakwater. Are we, are, are we creating any whirlpool or vortex where we're actually scouring and undermining the structure or are we actually ejecting the juvenile fish we're trying to protect and provide refuge for. So that kind of shifted these towards the center because we were kind of creating this moment of vortex at the edge. You can kind of see that here as well. Uh, but on the right, this is kind of looking at the sediment transport on the, on the bottom or, or the, the sea floor and how that is affected. So we, we don't want to have too much sediment drop or actually kind of accrue too much sediment around these, these habitats we're trying to create. So finding that Goldilocks zone, right? And then how do we site this thing uh, uh, elevationally within the water? Uh, we wanted to have an emergent top, obviously for navigational aid, but also for bird nesting and then uh, uh, the harbor seal. Um, and then that kind of critical zone of, uh, from mean high water to mean low water where the, the water is actually fluctuating. We want to maximize the surface area of that tidal action. So you can see the, the gentle slope here of the reef streets. So we're actually accruing growth on, on the, the structures itself. And then subtitle, we're able to have more vertical structures to actually just hold it up and get it to the elevation because we're dealing with a lot of different uh, uh, depths. Uh, and then what are the materials? So you know we have core stone, uh, traditional riprap or exterior stone, uh, armor units. Um, but this is the bio uh, enhanced units that we've introduced to uh, the reef streets. So these are actually kind of giving us, a, like, like I said, a little bit of a heart's head start. But these are essentially units with a, a proprietary or low pH uh, cement blend with uh, an inherent facial uh, complexity that kind of in encourages or recruits growth. And uh, also these tide pools, which on a micro scale are small tide pools that actually delay the, 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 the tide and kind of mimic what's happening on a macro scale at, at a very small scale. Um, and this is just kind of a, a, a look at this unit where we have these kind of different plug and play options where it could be a fish hub or an oyster hatchery uh, could actually support planting. So we're able to kind of test different configurations uh, with this one unit, which is kind of interesting and gave us a lot of control as we move forward when we're gonna look at how, how, how the thing works and look at monitoring. Um, so this is uh, in plan view, the, the reef street itself. So looking at the notion of a fish street, which is kind of those, bio, uh, those units are actually geared towards uh, fish habitat oyster street, uh, a combined street where we're doing uh, both are happening, and then a, a control street. So the, the idea of inherent controls being built into these structures allow us to come back and actually have meaningful uh, monitoring tools. Um, and then the breakwaters themselves. So this is kind of the central segment of the pilot project uh, where we have an actual control uh, with no reef street, uh, a secondary control with reef streets with no uh, bioenhanced units, and then three replicated uh, uh, breakwaters here to test for any anomalies or uh, any variances. And then also I just, I, you know, as, as a firm we, we totally invest our time in participating <laughs> with the harbor. Uh, here is a, a Lemon Creek with the Billion Oysters Project who is a very uh, uh, intimate partner with the project itself and then uh, kind of doing some sorghum grass planting in Sunset Park with the, some uh, citizen scientists. So 
So very much kind of trying to put the proof in the pudding and understand how these things are working. Um, and, and the second project I wanted to talk about quickly uh, is at the edge. Um, so just some quick context. This is the city, uh, New York City. This is uh, in Brooklyn. You can see, obviously, the industrial maritime edge, which is this hard edge that's been built out of Urbanville over time. So in New York City, we're looking at some 520 miles of this condition. Uh, it's very, this is our site that I'm going to get into in a second here. Uh, this is uh, Erie Basin, which it received unloading from all the ships from the Erie Canal, and it was then distributed throughout the city. But our site here uh, was actually a sugar refinery where the raw sugar would be unloaded and processed and then sent out. Um, this is the historic shoreline, so you can see the, the, the difference here. And this is kind of what New York was, right, before the uh, industrialization. Um, this is a historic drawing over time of when it was an active uh, maritime waterfront. Um, you can actually see this being the exist, uh, existing shoreline. And right now, the, the, the community itself is dealing with uh, extreme problems with nuisance flooding. It's the lowest lying area in the city. Uh, it's uh, greatly, this is essentially the flood line in Sandy. <laughs> um, so it's interesting to see these kind of uh, correlations. Uh, but they kind of created an interesting problem for us when we were designing the project where we had to be, by building code, out of the 100-year floodplain, which was nearly eight feet off the street level. So it, it's when you're trying to, and again, the concept of this project, I don't know if I said it clearly, was literally how do we begin to break down this edge and kind of reintroduce some of these ideas within the urban context when you're so limited on real estate, so limited on economics, where you're kind of cutting into the building footprints of a place. So to see something like this is, is interesting. So this is literally what we're trying to avoid, which is kind of that uh, uh, urban kind of response uh, that we see so much in New York City. And I think to your point, to, to kind of the complexity, right? There's something about this is binary. It's like land, water. There's like no interaction or any uh, dialogue at all. Uh, um, this is our site on the ground. Uh, so we have two basins on either side of the site. Uh, to the left is kind of uh, just a kind of restored promenade. Uh, this is our site here. And we really just fell in love with the degraded state of it. And the fact that by degrading it, it there was an inherent complexity that introduced itself over time. And there was an emergent quality to it. Uh, a lot of these concrete planes actually fell off into the water and kind of became intertidal. So you can actually see uh, the recruitment happening over time and thinking, how can we preserve this but restore it to a state where you know, our client could occupy it and use it? Um, so the site design uh, itself, this is the, the actual project. It's a commercial development. Uh, it, it is uh, with a private develop developer. Uh, basically, the first role is, uh, job is to kind of stabilize the shore uh, from what it was from the photos you saw. Um, nearly, uh, I want to say, 1,800 linear feet of waterfront, so a great opportunity. Um, you can see Manhattan here, and then, uh, this is that neighborhood. Um, so so we kind of approach the design in three different ways, of, uh, or three different edge, kind of thinking of each edge as kind of a, a different kind of character. Um, I'll go over quickly. In this photo, you can see in this basin, uh, uh, an adjacent park. So this really became uh, what we called the eco-recreational edge, or a passive basin that uh, we wanted to encourage people to get down to the water and actually kayak and occupy it. Uh, over here, you can actually see a very different character, which is an active marina. Uh, these are city uh, water, water taxis with a private marina kind of tucked away that you can't see here. And then here, this is really just serving the building and drawing people down to the waterfront. So a restaurant space, a, a large amphitheater. Uh, this is actually a gym for the uh, tenants. But here, we really wanted to have this nice, uh, kind of going back to that site photo you saw where this big plane kind of tilts and goes into the water and kind of begin to graphically trace the intertidal motion uh, here. And this is actually the only opportunity where we were able to actually expand the section. Everywhere else we're dealing, due to kind of waterfront uh, regulation, or it basically only provides a 40-foot offset required by the developer. So we're dealing with these 40-foot little narrow channels where we're trying to introduce uh, tidal action for the ecological value and to break down and soften that edge. But when you bring in mean high water, then you have to do 40 feet from that. So then you're cutting into the, the floor area of the building. So the economics didn't quite align, but we, we were able to work with city planning to get, get this through uh, with the 40 foot allowing water in. Um, so 
looking at uh, the plan quickly, this is uh, the eco-recreational edge. That is what we coined the eco-recreational edge. Uh, that's that passive basin uh, in the basin panorama. I'm not sure where my text is showing up. Uh, to the south, and that's kind of that uh, programmed edge with the amphitheater and, again, the drop corner. And then the urban maritime, which is actually you know, directly dealing with active boat traffic. Uh, so very different kind of uh, external tr uh, trigger. Um, within this urban maritime edge, we've looked at adding a tidal shelf and then actually a uh, revetment edge where the landscape actually passes over. Um, on the eco uh, recreational, it's a kayak launch with uh, tidal terracing. So again, the idea that on each edge we would showcase some kind of uh, breaking down or softening of the, the edge. Um, and then this is the 100 year <laughs> flood projection. So you can see that the site is completely inundated. Um, so looking forward, knowing that this is the 100 year event today, uh, uh, this kind of pushed us to really test, like understand new baselines of how frequently is this really gonna happen, right? This isn't the 100 year flood, really. It's, it's gonna happen more and more often. Uh, that's gonna ha have to inform the planting species, the durability of the materials. Um, you know, looking at spring high tide, which is actually beginning, I, I would say in the next five years, we'll be kind of coming over this edge. Um, or if there is any kind of event during that time, it will be over the edge. So there's, there's a lot of factors here. And I'd say this is very much a coastal site and very much going to uh, influence by those factors. Um, and the areas in kind of darker blue here are the, those intertidal zones I was mentioning. Um, and so considering all these things, like looking to plant communities, we often are inspired conceptually by native, I guess, ecologies uh, to where uh, this is inspired by kind of the uh, New York regional kind of coastal section of the low marsh, the high marsh, uh, uh, the, the, the salt shrub, and then the upland forest. So there's just kind of different interpretations of that around the site. Um, and just quickly getting into each of the edges, I'll run through uh, each quickly. Uh, looking at the uh, urban maritime edge again, the idea of flying over this kind of degraded landscape that was very much inspired by the existing conditions, uh, this kind of more level experience uh, with the amphitheater as a draw from the street, but also part of the, the, this edge is kind of these overlook moments where you can actually view uh, the maritime traffic and actually view the active uh, harbor in, in, in action, which is somewhat getting rarer, I would say, in, in, in the city. Uh, and then also these zones of inundation where you can actually look down and, and see the tide moving into the site. Um, this is another existing kind of historic construction that was at the site, which was really interesting. This is uh, historic timber cribbing where they would build basically these log cabins out of timber, fill it with riprap or stone or ballast and sink it and then backfill with earth and stone. And basically that's how you would artificially fill out the city. But over time, you can see that this first row of timber has fallen into the water, and you get this really kind of cool uh, re repetition of, of the stone, of the uh, timber with the actual stone slumping away. And I hope that kind of reads in this section, but that was like directly uh, inspiring this edge. Um, but here we were able to kind of uh, insert a canopy layer that we were able to pass through within the riprap. Rip uh, so we had a soil engineer on this project and also worked very intimately with the marine engineers. So this, within this 40 foot zone, you had almost three or four professional teams kind of coordinating the complexity of this one, of each of the sections I'm gonna show you. Uh, and then there is that tidal shelf that we were looking at. Um, and then also kind of in response to the boat wake, we were able to just develop this sheet pile detail where every other sheet pile would be removed and it would actually mitigate some of the wake and also some of the debris that comes in uh, uh, and kind of gets caught behind these walls and racks around in, in our shelves, the wetland area. Uh, and then the eco-recreational edge, which really had a social aspect of getting people down to the water. Uh, we were able to work with a developer to get uh, a local partner of a kayaking group that there will be space carved out for them uh, to kind of store the kayaks. Um, and as a complement to that, we, we added these the tidal terracing, terracing units. Uh, which are basically plots that are subtital, intertidal, and then upland. And we really see this as a great, I guess, testing or monitoring opportunity. Uh, we're still trying to find a partner for that, but the idea is that, you know, we could test different species because it will, uh, and almost water levels over time, because it, it will be these set datums that can, we can kind of, uh, in a way, rigorously monitor. Um, and this is that section. So this, this actual edge is actually completely uh, pile supported. 
Uh, so it looks like a landscape on grade, but the soils were so bad in the area and the neighborhood that the entire edge is essentially supported on piles. Um, and this is just one of those terrace, uh, views of the terrace. Um, and then finally, uh, looking at the southern edge, uh, really wanting to create this kind of powerful section. So the water taxi drives through here of this, this dropped corner and then the flipped edge. Um, and this, again, this is really this moment where we can have the true kind of shoreline section or our interpretation of it, I guess I would say. Um, where, which you can see here where we're able to kind of have this large pitch plane that again is just like the breakwater shallow kind of creating the maximum surface area within the tidal range. Uh, and then adding this kind of boardwalk where people can kind of walk through and kind of perceive the section from both sides where they're seeing the tidal uh, area and then also the upland forest that we've created. Um, for the, the surfacing of uh, this area here, we're using an e-concrete mattressing unit. Uh, but so basically it's just laid on, it's much like a blanket. It's threaded together, these units that are very pliable and bendable. As you can see, there's a lot of limitations, or not a lot of limitations to movements. Uh, but working with uh, a proprietary, uh, uh, CARC, the same company worked with for Living Breakwaters, this is one of their proprietary uh, modules where it's actually the same kind of concept of an inherent complexity and then uh, uh, kind of encourages recruitment over time. So really hoping to get this kind of really living edge or shelf here. Um, and we were actually able to go down to Florida and see a test pilot of this, which was really interesting. This is about after 12 months. So uh, we're hoping that these will really uh, grow quickly over time. But also, I guess the idea is that when we place objects like these in the landscape, they become like signifiers of, of these ecological activities happening. Um, I would say objects, you know, but uh, it's just kind of a, a good way to bring attention to some of these areas. Um, and then this is just on the upland area looking, looking back down at that full section. Um, I think that's all I have, but I, I would just say that things like this is, is kind of uh, looking towards a system, you know, when you have 520 miles and like if there's a way to get something like this in the zoning code rather, or the, the waterfront zoning code rather than uh, the minimalist approach where we're kind of encouraging wet and dry divisions, but these soft divisions, I think you would have a more systematic approach. And I can't remember the term that David used, uh, I forget it now, but basically working from the bottom up, right? This, this is a way to work from the bottom up uh, to kind of address some of these complexities that we're dealing with. Right? Um, yeah, and thank you.